right, I'll go ahead and at least uh, just start the introduction. Uh, Dr. Day, unfortunately, is not able to make this session because he's on call today. Um, but um, I am very happy to present for the subcortical um, surgery group. Today, the talks are going to be about um, using uh, molecular characterization and diagnosis um, in the modern era. Um, I am going to present on using um, integrating precision medicine into the operating room, and Dr. Dickinson is going to talk about uh, patient-derived xenografts. Not sure what time it is. Is it okay to get started? Or yeah, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and kick it off. That would be great, just so we could stay on time. Okay, sounds good. And if someone could give me a little bit of a five minute warning, that would also be good. I don't see a clock. Um, thank you. Um, all right, great. Um, well, I'm Dr. Rodriguez. I work at uh, University of Arkansas Medical Sciences. My talk today is about the new OR and how you may change some of the practices in your operating room. Um, now that we have a lot of interesting studies coming out in regards to how we can integrate uh, precision medicine into our practice. So I'm kind of giving this talk as a point of view um, as a neurosurgeon. So first, I'm just going to talk about what is precision medicine. You hear that a lot. You hear that word being thrown around. Um, and then go into how we use uh, sequencing in order to stratify patients and just a little brief overview of sequencing. And then the brain tumor biobank that we have at our institution. And then um, do a couple of case studies. These are all uh, high-grade glioma patients, um, all recurrent high-grade gliomas. Uh, and then go into some areas of future directions. So again, precision medicine, you hear it all the time. What does it mean? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be in regards to cancer. It's just in general in regards to medical care. Um, obviously, um, many times a person comes in with a certain diagnosis and is given a medicine or some intervention, and um, they may have a different outcome than the other person. Um, if you were to take into account someone's genetics, someone's environment, um, someone's culture, you may find that certain treatments might be better for them and they have better outcomes. So how do we understand who does better and maybe tailor specific therapy for them? In regards to oncology, uh, one of the main things that have been used to stratify patients and understand what outcomes are better for them or what treatments may benefit them, uh, we have used a lot of genomics. So just a brief overview um, of genomics. Um, basically, what is genomics? Um, obviously, understanding the, the structure and function of DNA. Um, and the human genome was sequenced in 2003, so almost 20 years ago. Um, this is a timeline, I, I call it like a timeline from a neurosurgeon oncologist uh, point of view. So 2003, human genome was sequenced. 2005, the STOOP protocol came out. Um, with, for those of you who may not be familiar, that's the protocol we use for GBM, where we give people temozolomide and radiation. That came out in 2005, the same year that we had next generation sequencing come out. So that is actually allows us to really identify mutations. And then in 2008, glioblastoma was the first cancer in the cancer genome atlas. Um, so it's actually pretty well characterized in regards to uh, other tumors. Um, and then in 2016, the World Health Organization came out with the brain tumor guidelines and started integrating molecular markers. All of a sudden, you had to know the IDH mutation status in order to make a diagnosis. So now, mutations aren't just for fun. You have to know them in order to diagnose the patient. And this past summer in 2021, we have new WHO guidelines and again, molecular markers are integrated in diagnosis. But that's not the only place where they're important. So what about for cancer? How can you use genetics to identify drug targets? So there was a large study called NCI Match, uh, where they took thousands of cancer patients, they had them undergo gene sequencing, and they thought, well, 
I'll find out uh, what mutations they have, and then I'll find drug targets. Um, so NCI MATCH stands for Molecular Analysis for Therapeutic Choice. They enrolled thousands of patients. And here you can just see all the different mutations. I'm not sure if you see my mouse, but the first uh, most common mutation is TP53. Um, and among the patients, they said, okay, about 37% um, had a mutation that I have a drug for, and that means actionable. And about close to 20% I can assign to a therapy. Um, but what they found was it was really hard um, sometimes for the therapy to work because there were resistance pathways already present in the tumor. And also feasibility was really difficult. Um, TP53 was the most, it's the most common mutation in cancer, but there's no drug against a TP53 mutation. So that is a little bit daunting. Um, so kind of this, we'll come back to this in the future about what we can do when the DNA doesn't give you information that's helpful. So when I started at UAMS, I, I kind of thought about what information do we gather? So when we see a patient, we get, um, you know, imaging, so we can actually do radiomics and kind of understand the imaging characteristics. We take out the, the tumor, we either do a biopsy or resection. We can potentially grow the tissue outside the body. We can do genetics. And then we can perhaps um, uncover, uncover personalized treatment. And when the patient's tumor comes back, we have a new way to treat them. So what does that mean? Um, so basically, um, how do we take the information from the operating room to the bench? So here are, are tumor samples. Um, and at the top, you see a traditional chunk of GBM tissue um, and just cut out of the body and taken to the lab. Um, we at our institution typically like to use um, the Myriad Miko device because it um, kind of uh, does a lot of the mechanical disassociation for you. So here is once you open that little vial, you can see that the tumor is already mechanically disassociated, it kind of decreases processing time. And then you can disassociate the tumor probably within an hour, depending on which protocol you use. And then you can grow tumor cells in various ways in 3D structures or traditional two-dimensional structures. Um, we're very much interested in tumor modeling, for example, looking at invasion over time. Here are tumor organoids on the left um, invading into um, extracellular matrix and, and we're screening different drugs. And here is just a little piece of a tumor fragment um, that we extracted from the Myriad device that we just grew in the dish. And it seems to be very happy. It has all of its um, natural environment. We don't disassociate the tumor and it, it, uh, we can follow them over time, these little micro tumors over time. Um, so we um, thought that this technology could be really powerful and eventually help us with our patients. Um, so in the first year we, we did tumor banking, um, we had about almost close to 50-50 in regards to males and females. Um, we, over time, got better. We started to integrate this into our surgical uh, pathway. So we started to think about, um, at first it was, you can see in the early months, we didn't have as many patients, but over time we started to approach every patient about the possibility of, of donation. Um, most patients were glioma patients, but we also have metastasis and meningioma and then other types of tumors. And we also had um, patients come from all over our state and sometimes even outside of us, our state, which is really important when you think about environmental things that you may want to look at or test. So currently, um, we do a standardized protocol in which um, intraoperatively, we have uh, the surgeon um, working with the pathologist, we typically send um, different sections of the tumor, for example, um, an area of the tumor that enhances avidly with gliolin, we send that separately to our pathologist. Um, and then some 
cases that can change the grade of the tumor. You don't want to miss a tumor that may be low grade in 95% of the region, but high grade in less than 5%. We sequence, we ask everyone if they want um, next generation sequencing. And then we're very conscientious about tumor harvesting, um, looking at regional tissue in regards to, do you want tissue from the subventricular zone? Do you want tissue from the center or the periphery of the tumor? And exactly how do you extract the tumor and uh, de decreasing uh, heat damage, et cetera. And then these all can be used um, to study um, tumors and develop different models as we demonstrated earlier. And so this um, paper that we wrote earlier this year kind of summarizes the role of the neurosurgeon and, and some considerations that you make in the operating room that both affect patient outcome as well as research. So I'll just go into um, some case studies to kind of explain, well, what does this look like in real life? How do you do precision medicine in real life? Um, so this patient came in, a 60-year-old male, he had a brain tumor resected about five years prior to presentation, um, was doing very well, high functional status, no deficits. Um, his previous pathology was thought to be a, a pleomorphic um, xanthroastrocytoma um, versus a glioblastoma. Our neuropathologist reviewed it and felt it was consistent with glioblastoma. He had previously had temozolamide and radiation and so now he had this dural base lesion originally um, in the temporal region. And now you can see this enhancement in the temporal lobe that's intraaxial. I didn't show the flare sequencing, but also um, a lot of increased flare signal in that right temporal lobe. So he went to surgery. He had surgery with glialin, um, got that uh, tumor resected, the pathology came back consistent with GBM. Um, again, we do next generation sequencing for uh, all of our patients. To, uh, and this patient from the next generation sequencing had a BRAF mutation, B600, um, as you can see down here, as well as a TERP promoter mutation. So the BRAF mutation is something that is targetable. There is a BRAF inhibitor, and that's something he got to be started on just recently published within the last month, a New England uh, Journal of Medicine study showing um, how effective BRAF inhibitors are. Um, and then the TERP promoter, it's good to know. It tells you a little bit about prognosis, but again, um, not something that um, necessarily can be targeted well at this time. So um, what about this patient? She's a 37-year-old woman. Um, 15 months ago, she had an uh, IDH mutant grade four astrocytoma. If you're familiar with the two 2021 guidelines, IDH mutants are no longer called GBM, so we have to call them grade four. Um, so she is doing pretty well functionally. She has some mild focal seizures controlled with Keppra, still able to walk, um, went, had chemo and radiation, um, after her index surgery, but she's coming into you with this huge tumor crossing over to the other side. Um, you can see the size of this and um, trying to shop around for clinical trials. Of note, most recurrent GBM trials won't enroll a patient like this. This tumor is too big. Um, most GBM trials, you're looking at maybe two centimeters in maximum diameter, um, maybe sometimes up to four, but very rarely you're gonna have someone with 6.9 centimeters, lots of edema, shift. Um, and so she came to us and uh, I thought, well, you have a good functional status, you're pretty young. We will definitely try to help you out. Um, took her to surgery. Um, again, use glialin. Um, also, she, we do sometimes consider giving radiation again, but she lives in a rural area and didn't want to um, have um, take the trips to radiation. So we did gamma tile. So we placed uh, gamma tile intraoperatively. Um, next generation sequencing. You can see she has a bunch of mutations, um, very high. And like we talked about TP53, that's good to know that she has it, but unfortunately we can't target that now. Um, she has other mutations that currently aren't targetable, but I guess um, what 
what can we give her? Um, of interest is that her tumor mutational burden is really high at 62. Um, what is tumor mutational burden? Um, basically, it's just how much mutations you have per megabase of DNA. And the higher the tumor mutational burden, the more likely you are to respond to immunotherapy. So typically, GBM patients are coming in with a tumor mutational burden less than 10. She's at 62 in the 99th percentile among all tumors, not just GBM. So now this is a patient that you say, okay, we did all this. I can't target your mutations, but maybe I should put you on immunotherapy. So that's what she's going to get. Fingers crossed that, you know, this extends her life. So um, what about how do we integrate precision medicine with tumor banking? So this last case will kind of combine how we use sequencing data and um, tumor banking, actually having the patient's tissue. So this patient is a 24-year-old male who presented, um, he has a history of leaf from many syndrome. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, this is a germline TP53 mutation, um, autosomal dominant. It's a cancer predisposition syndrome. Um, these patients, by the time they're 30 years old, 90% of them are gonna have some sort of cancer. So here is his first tumor that he came in with, big left-sided GBM. Um, thankfully was able to get a gross total resection. His pathology was a little bit strange though. Our, our um, pathologist said, well, yeah, it looks like a high-grade glioma, but it had features of ependymoma and pleomorphic xanthros uh, astrocytoma. So we thought this is a weird tumor, um, maybe something we're going to have to think about precision medicine options down the road. So we looked at this um, with a group from University of California, Santa Cruz. And what we looked at was RNA sequencing. So here's just a big map. Every single dot is a tumor. And this is all cancer. So there's over 12,000 um, tumors here uh, represented and tumors that are more similar cluster together. Um, so looking at um, glioblastoma, which is green, we see that there is only about one patient that's kind of similar to ours. Um, we have some patients that have ependymomas in the purple that are similar to our patient, but our patient's kind of all over the place and doesn't really have another tumor like it, meaning that this is a very unique tumor. So we looked within our own cohort of patients at the time. We had about 45 patients sequenced that had high-grade gliomas. And we looked at our patient of interest, which was patient one, um, looking at their DNA mutations. Um, and uh, really from the DNA, we really couldn't find much that could uh, be targeted. We did see that there was a mutation um, in RB1 and NF1 as well. Um, but not necessarily things that are traditionally targeted with uh, current medicines. So um, we worked with uh, the Treehouse uh, Childhood Cancer Initiative. Um, what we did is took, uh, looked at the RNA. So looked at, well, what genes and pathways are overexpressed in our patient? The DNA isn't helping us out. What about the RNA? Can we find something that is significantly overexpressed in our patient that we can target with an FDA approved drug? And then since we have the tissue, maybe test it out um, on his tumor tissue. So that's what we did. Here we started with just our patient, um, patient one, um, and looked at, uh, we found that he had overexpression on this pathway, STAT1 and STAT2. Here he is. Um, showing the highest level of expression and the red bar is our patient of interest and each individual dots are other patients within our institutional cohort. You can see that he's in the yellow zone, which is above the standard deviation. So he's highly expressing this gene pathway. Um, now we're going to go into, let's compare him to more patients. So let's look at um, a huge cancer consortium of 12,000 patients and we can still see he's very high and then look at just 200 GBMs. And again, very high. Our patient is overexpressing this pathway. So we thought, okay, well, let's test. We have, we, we tumor bank our patients. Let's get the cells from that uh, first surgery and look at his um, 
tumor um, test a drug that targets this pathway, which is ruxolinative, and compare it to other patients who had various levels of expression. Um, and when we did that, uh, we saw that the cell line from this patient still retained the same level of high expression. Um, and the cell line from patient one is still a little crazy. It looks similar to other cell lines from various cancers. So we kind of know, again, not surprising, our tumor patient is very unique. The cell line we got from it, very unique as well. Um, and then we used a um, organoid model where we grew tiny mini tumors and incubated the drug of interest with the patient's tumor and tried to understand, can this work? And our patient um, seemed to respond the best um, in comparison to other patients. Um, patient 23 also had high expression that could be targeted uh, along this pathway. So we thought, wow, that's interesting. Um, we could predict based on RNA sequencing that these two patients would respond to this drug and grew the cells outside the body. And that's what we see. Um, so what ended up happening, this patient is very complicated. Um, so he's still alive over two years out. This is his index surgery. He ended up having um, many recurrences and I operated on him a lot of uh, multiple times. Towards the end, um, you can see 1F and 1G. Um, so 1F, he had a surgery. We took out that tumor and there is a clinical trial we enrolled him on called 3D Predict, where they grow the tumor outside the body and screen drugs. We found that his tumor could be responsive to an EGFR inhibitor, and we tried him on it. He failed within two months, and then the new tumor grew. We took that one out and looked again um, using that 3D Predict uh, assay. So 3D Predict is um, actually taking fresh tumor tissue and screening multiple drugs. And this is a, a, just an example of a report that you get. You screen um, these 12 drugs and you get a report as a clinician of what is potentially a responder and what is not. And so for our patient, um, at one of his uh, more recent recurrences, um, it showed that osimertinib, which is EGFR inhibitor, was a responder. We put the patient on that drug. Two months later, he failed. We had to do surgery again, and now you can see he's no longer a responder. It seemed like his tumor figured out that pathway, overcame it, just was like, I'm done with EGFR inhibition. I can find a resistance pathway. So then we were thinking, okay, we see Everolimus, um, you know, that sometimes is used for benign tumors. You think of tuberous, uh, tuberous sclerosis patients, maybe we can give him that. Um, so that was something that came to mind. And we also had um, some indication over time, uh, we looked at mTOR. So Everolimus is an mTOR inhibitor. We looked at the mTOR pathway over time and we said, okay, that's still high. Um, all the previous data I showed you was on his index tumor. So we were looking at, okay, over time, does this STAT pathway stay high? And over all these recurrences, it did. So then we said, let's, let's take the tumor tissue from his last recurrence and let's figure out if we test it with ruxolinitib and everolimus in our organoid model, does his tumor respond? Um, and um, it, it did. So this patient ended up getting a combination. We figured from our previous um, history with him, when we gave one targeted agent, two months later, he failed. So let's give two targeted agents um, and see what happens. So um, this has been the, this was the longest time he was recurrence free, four months stable um, on these two different drugs identified by using functional precision medicine, which is when you grow the tumor outside the body and actually test the drugs on the tumor tissue itself. Um, so this paper just recently came out um, feel free to read it um, so you can understand some of the nuances I didn't have time to, to cover, but it's a very exciting work. Um, so what are some future directions? Um, one uh, thing that I didn't get to talk about a lot was diagnosis. 
getting better. We need to identify mutations and RNA sequencing earlier. We don't want to wait weeks because, especially in certain malignant tumors like recurrent GBM, you don't really have weeks. So getting better with sequencing. Um, using functional precision medicine, where we use the tissue, um, we can uh, identify probably more targets and kind of test what might work, and maybe also combination ther therapies. And last um, is validation and implementation, validating organoid platforms and also implementation, uh, because you have to get certain drugs uh, approved by insurance. So practically, sometimes this is very difficult to implement. Um, I would like to thank all my collaborators, um, as well as the funding agencies, and thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. That was fascinating. Um, I just want to remind everyone if there's some Q&A to go ahead and um, send them in. It looks like we did get a few questions, Dr. Rodriguez. The first one is, are you routinely harvesting regionally within the tumor? Um, yes, so we do. So it depends on like, for example, if we have an ongoing study and we know we want to get um, a certain region, um, we do. And typically for um, GBM, we do send, um, for example, gliolin, regions, fluorescent regions separately or reason, regions that are near the ventricular zone. We're starting to even do that with metastasis as well. Okay, great, thank you. And then there was another one that came through, does NGS require a greater volume of tissue than we have typically collected through biopsy? No, you can um, definitely sequence from um, biopsy, just the classic um, core that you get from the, the needle biopsy core, you can get next generation sequencing. That NCI match trial, a lot of those patients just had biopsies, they did not even have full resections. Okay, great. And then um, one more, sorry, they keep filtering in, which is great because we want this to be an interactive webinar. Um, how difficult in the OR is collecting the tissue and the quality you are needing for next genome sequencing? So um, it depends on what you want to do. So DNA, um, as you know, can be sequenced like later in time. You think of like paleo, <laughs> paleogeontology where they're like extracting DNA from fossils. So DNA, like you can extract it from old tissue or formal and fixed tissue. When you start doing RNA sequencing, that's when things get complicated. Single cell sequencing, RNA sequencing, it's starting to degrade very rapidly. Um, we tend to be a little bit biased towards um, using the Nico Myriad. And I will say, I don't have any disclosures. I'm not a, a part of that company, but we have implemented using them frequently because it mechanically disassociates the tumor. Um, and we are, um, have a lot of temperature control, we can keep it on ice. Um, so that seems to be what um, we tend to prefer. Um, I have gotten cells from Sonopet washings or just from a big chunk of tumor. Um, but again, if you're doing, you want to decrease time in processing. And so some of those other formats, when you come to the lab with a big chunk of tumor, you spend an hour chopping it up with razor blades and the RNA is already dying. So you need to um, kind of figure out pathways to decrease time. Great, thank you. Um, and then there was another one that came in. In your experience, how quickly does proteomic information degrade? Um, so proteomics, um, I know, um, I guess everything like DNA, RNA, and proteomics, you can extract from formal and fixed um, I, I guess it depends on what type of proteomics. So for example, if you're doing like metabolomics or like real time changes, um, sometimes the pathways are changing as tissues get oxidized or um, start dying. And so the pathways that you're looking at may not be you know, the true pathways because it, the cell is being stressed or actually starting to go, uh, you know, starting to die or it, go through apoptosis. Um, so 
I think you would still be successful in getting protein extracted, but would it be representative of the true tumor? Probably not um, if you didn't do things to preserve the tissue. Okay, great. Um, so there was one final one. Um, when you use 3D predict, how important is the fresh tissue sample? Meaning does your collection process improve your results with 3D predict? Um, yeah, so 3D predict does require fresh tissue. It requires 0 0.1 grams ideally. Um, so a couple things with that. Um, we sometimes send um, needle biopsy cores to 3D predict, but I always, and I say always with capital letters, um, especially if it's a recurrent GBM, I always confirm with the pathologist that there's viable tumor. I don't want to send someone necro necrosis or something else. Um, and that's the same thing when I'm doing an open case. I, I do love the gliolin. I know not everyone uses it. I send them like a bright area of gliolin is like super hot pink. And I'm like, this is viable tissue. I'm not sending you some necrotic um, area. I'm sending you high quality viable tissue. You don't want to send out tissue that has necrosis or radiation change. So um, you have to communicate with your pathologist or if you're doing an open case, um, I think as again, the surgeon is critical. If you're an experienced surgeon, you know what necrotic tumor is and viable tumor is. Um, and you don't necessarily need gliolin, but I think the gliolin, it can be very helpful. Okay, awesome. Well, Dr. Um, Dickinson, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, um, we'll get going with your presentation and then we'll have time still at the end for more um, Q&A. So keep the questions coming in. Okay, everyone see my screen and am I off mute? Yes, it looks great and we can hear you. <laughs> awesome. Well, hi everyone and thank you for allowing me to share our experience. Dr. Sorciano and I work for uh, uh, Sutter Healthcare, which is a large um, multi-hospital and multi-clinic service here in Northern California in the Bay Area and in the Central Valley. Uh, I do have some disclosures. Uh, Nico uh, did provi uh, provide us with a research grant, and I do some uh, physician education for them. And I'll be mentioning a private company, Certis Oncology, which has also given us some research support, and uh, I have stock options in their company. Uh, so to outline my talk, I was going to go into the various mirroring models that can be employed in you know, uh, studying central nervous system tumors and discuss methods of tissue collection, which Dr. Rodriguez kind of outlined as well. And then uh, talk about our clinical trial with uh, using these models, and then a novel tool now for looking at mirroring neuro-oncology. To start with, the mirroring models that are employed for research in malignant tumors include syngenetic mod uh, models, which basically you're taking and exposing a mouse to uh, a, a carcinogenic pathogen, uh, your mouse gets a tumor, you create cell culture from those cells and then inject that into a new mouse and use that as your model for studying uh, basically a mouse tumor. Uh, genetically engineered uh, mice models can also be created where you literally engineer the, the, uh, the malignancy in the tumor use a transgenic technology and put that into uh, uh, a, the mouse with the brain tumor. And then there are two types of human cell lines. One would be taking predetermined cell lines that have been grown and study them in mice or taking neurospheres from uh, uh, patient-derived cells and uh, growing them up and then using them in the mouse model. So uh, in looking at the advantages and disadvantages of these, the uh, syngenaic model is excellent for looking at immunotherapy uh, research because it literally is a tumor that you've created in this mouse and, and can be studied that way. But 
it may not really be applicable to human glioblastoma if you're making what's a mouse glioblastoma. How, how are we going to look at those uh, uh, other than in looking at immune systems? It's not going to be very useful. Genetically engineered mo uh, mice models are going to have kind of the same limitations. You're, you're basically creating a mouse tumor as opposed to a human tumor. The Z, they're currently uh, available cell line xenografts. They, they have a very high growth rate and good reproducibility, but they may not recapitulate the genetic problems that your particular patient has. And uh, like in, in the, uh, uh, unlike in the other uh, mouse models, you do need to have an immunodeficient mouse to, to get the tumor, uh, the human tumor to grow in the mouse. And then uh, specifically, we're going to talk uh, about patient-derived xenografts because that's what we're using in our lab. And this recapitulates the genetics and the phenotype of the tumor of the original tumor in your patient. But you run a much lower uh, in capacity to grow and uh, engraft these patients. And again, you need to use an immunodeficient mouse, so you can't really study uh, uh, immune therapies in this model. So the way we generate these uh, xenografts is to uh, basically take the tumor from uh, out of the patient. And uh, Lily and I, her lab is actually on the peninsula and I'm in the East Bay. So there is a transport time. Uh, once the tumor gets to her lab, uh, often late in the day, I keep her there. And she needs to then uh, take those cells, disassociate them, basically by putting in a mild papain-based enzyme solution at 37 degrees centigrade. And then those cells are expanded in this culture, in a uh, culture to create what we call the PDXC or the patient-derived culture, cell culture. Uh, after we have enough cells, we can then take 300,000 of those cells in a four microliter volume, and we inject it into the brain of a mouse using a stereotactic frame. And then that then creates the, the PDX avatar. Uh, we then undergo test therapies in vivo. And over three to six months, we can develop a, a testing therapeutic uh, spectrum for our patients. Importantly, we do take the cells at one week after we've been uh, generating the cultures and test their, their uh, test them against the patient's original tumor to assure that there hasn't been uh, alterations in the genetics of the tumor by uh, pass-through. And what we have been able to do is we currently have 70 glioblastoma uh, PDX models and 20 metastatic models growing. And we have about a 67% tumor take for the GBMs if they're wild type. We don't grow mutations well, they just don't take as well. And 60% of our brain metastasis also take in the, uh, in the intracranial implantation. There's a just better than 85% concordance in the driver mutations between our human tumors and the, the uh, uh, avatars. And that gene uh, genomic fidelity is, in check is checked in all of our patients before uh, implantation. We have a high, we do a high throughput drug screening uh, or HTDS that we customize for each patient based on what we find on their uh, genomic testing. And we determine the most effective treatment combination for each specific tumor. And then we validate that in vivo by injecting the cells into the mouse uh, and testing them against these combination therapies. So we can prove we, we can show that the GBM histological hallmarks are preserved. This is one of our patients that you can see the tumor in the patient and the tumor that grows in the mouse looks uh, basically identical. And these tumors, unlike in humans, they can grow quite large and uh, the skull of a mouse is expandable. So the, uh, the tumor gets large, but we can show that it does infiltrate into uh, the normal brain parenchyma, just as we see in our, our human tumors. These are infiltrative tumors within the uh, 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 PDX model. Likewise, we have mutations. Uh, the genetic mutations are preserved. Sometimes we'll see a, a, a downregulation within the, uh, the PDX, 
but we never see that these tumors are uh, creating new uh, genetic mutations uh, in, in our uh, PDX. So this is our methodology. We basically use uh, both the Nico Myriad uh, device that uh, Dr. Rodriguez has pointed out. It's this uh, basically a suction tool that has a, 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 um, a, a guillotine at the end that sucks small pieces of tumor into it and then collects it into a special, uh, special collecting uh, device. And uh, in this particular patient, we're showing how we use the tool collecting uh, through the uh, NICO uh, brain path. This is a 13.5 millimeter uh, aperture. And you just saw how we also collect tumor with a, a gross specimen as well. So there, that would have been the unblocked specimen. I use this tool in my left hand like a sucker. And then when uh, we, we allow a fair amount of bleeding, as you saw, I wasn't typically, you know, I wouldn't just let tumors like meningioma bleed, but we want, as pointed out by Dr. Rodriguez, quality of the tumor really depends on not using a lot of thermal or um, agitation energy that will just kill cells. So unlike a, uh, other cases, we'll allow a little more bleeding in these tumors and then control the bleeding at, uh, after we've got our tissue for, uh, uh, for culture. The, uh, the device itself, this kind of shows a little video that shows it's, you can see the little blades there are actually opening and this blade is opening and closing. So as you use an a, a accelerometer pedal that increases suction, uh, uh, you can very easily control how you're collecting this tissue. So we took our, our tissue that we've harvested this way and, and published this paper in Frontiers of Oncology, looking at uh, both the, the, there really wasn't a difference in these cells between the two techniques as far as survivability of our mice. Um, so they look identical and the histopathology looks identical. Uh, likewise, they had uh, genomic concordance uh, was identical and uh, was uh, uh, similar to the original GBM as previously mentioned. Interestingly though, the on-block and myriad derived samples had distinct uh, gene expression differences by these RNA plots. So the on-block cells ex overexpressed mitotic cycling and adhesion genes, whereas the myriad cells preferentially ex uh, expressed synaptic functioning and uh, chemokine uh, signaling genes. And you know we, we were curious why why is this? What are the possible reasons? And if we look at the method of collection, because of the the myriad tool uh, allows us to directly suction the tissue into a thermal uh, controlled uh, transfer device, as uh, pointed out by Dr. Rodriguez. It very rapidly is cooled. It's in smaller pieces so that uh, we use uh, less. Um, uh, uh, enzymatic, uh, basically less time. It only takes about 10 minutes to reach uh, disassociation of the cells, whereas it's more like 40 minutes to get, you know, to cut up and get the larger pieces, as, as again pointed out by Dr. Rodriguez. And this may have effects on how uh, the cells express. Um, Interestingly, though, we think that it's important to consider both of these uh, when making therapeutic options. And uh, as an example of this, you can see this uh, particular patient was uh, uh, patient uh, 222. There was a difference in, in its expression between the two. Uh, when we looked at the on-block reception, it really didn't involve, uh, you know, we can see the, the pathway for um, uh, PF3 signal, uh, uh, signaling, uh, but uh, it lacked the EGFR amplification mediated RAS signaling here. And that had some implications. So when we took those cells and uh, looked at their EGFR uh, um, uh, response, the response to latinib, which is an EGFR inhibitor, it really didn't have any effect. Whereas a mTOR, a, a further down along the EGFR pathway, 
was beneficial in this, but uh, it did show effect in killing the cells in uh, culture. In a second example, we can show uh, two patients that had the exact same mutation and uh, tested against uh, iratinib again, an EGFR inhibitor. Um, it was very effective in, uh, in one patient and would not be considered uh, uh, for this particular patient where it required uh, micromolar doses to actually reach any degree of uh, kill. So exact same mutation, but completely different response to the same, medica uh, same drug in, in culture. So when our philosophy has been that a single drug therapy is not going to prove very significant benefit in our patients because of the plethora of mutations we encounter and the tenacity to differentiate and lose those, as Dr. Rodriguez pointed out, that patient that was making that mRNA, but the recurrent tumor was no longer uh, making that mRNA. Thus, we have focused on creating dual and even sometimes three drug cocktails to assess efficacy in our model. And this slide outlines that process in uh, our patient number 192. We identified EGFR and uh, CDK and PK3 drivers for this tumor, dri uh, driving mutations for this uh, tumor uh, on their genomic testing. And we screened single agents as well as combination agents to assess the tumor viability in culture. And what you appreciate here is the best, you know, this is the scale, the dark red suggesting effect, the gray and lighter pinks being less effective in culture. And the greatest combination uh, with the greatest kill rate was the combination of the uh, erlotinib and a novel agent, MLN-128. As an aside, it's interesting to note that afidineb actually worsened the efficacy of several agents, both this temsirolimus and uh, 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 one of the other drugs, and MLN-128 when used in combination. Uh, armed with the PDX results, we then cr uh, created 10 avatars uh, in each of these groups uh, with both of the single arms and then in combination and basically could show in culture that the combination had a significant better uh, kill rate than the individual agents. Thus, having that information, uh, we created 10 avatars for each group, a vehicle, a, a basically just delivering vehicle versus uh, each of the single end agents, and then in combination, and you could see substantial uh, longer survival in the combination versus the single agent. And again, the fact that er, uh, erlatinib had no benefit as a single agent, but promoted the benefit that uh, MLN 0218 uh, provided. Also interesting, there are downstream targeting effects that we found in, in uh, this patient, 192. This is, uh, uh, while EGFR is not effective inhibition by erlatinib low, the combination treatment uh, uh, inhibited the protein expression and tumor pro uh, uh, proliferation. By performing these uh, RNA sequence of the treated tumors, we identified this downstream target for combination therapy, paracetin. Probably pronounced that wrong. <laughs> It is a pro-tumorigenic chemokine found in the tumor microenvironment, and it induces tumor-associated macrophages to become immunosuppressive. And so here we can show that uh, in the vehicle, there's very high uh, um, EGFR expression, uh, high uh, mitotic rate, and high expression of the periostatin. Uh, and then this is a marker actually for the macrophage, uh, uh, the tumor associated macrophages being in the specimen. Not much effect of erlotinib er, er, alone or even MLNO128 uh, alone with respect to these markers. But when in combination, we dramatically limit the amount of macro, these uh, TAMs, uh, tumor associated macrophages, uh, showing up in the tumor. Um, so, the benefit of these combinations not only is an inhibition of the GFR pathway and cell proliferation, 
but it may also inhibit immunosuppressing uh, uh, chemokines. Thus, potentially, this therapy in combination with immunotherapy uh, could result in more success. So this is the workflow that uh, we do for, for our patients. We basically remove the tumors, initiate the uh, uh, passage and uh, growing the cell cultures, um, create the uh, uh, drug list and rank the drug list, uh, uh, then treat in, in the mouse, and then create a report for uh, our tumor board uh, validating what uh, could be effective treatments for the patient. <clears throat> These reports basically is, uh, are drug response reports uh, that are taking into account the, both the genomics, uh, the, um, uh, our findings in, with PDX, and then the patient's profile uh, environmental effects as pointed out by Dr. Rodriguez. So our, our planned uh, clinical trial to individualize combinatorial therapy for recurrent GBM, we take the primary GBM patients, we consent them to take their tissue and uh, uh, use it for both research purposes and for potential uh, future therapies for them. They're enrolled into the program. Uh, we collect their tissue do the, uh, find the appropriate, uh, you know, this is going to take about three to eight months to get to the development of our uh, combination treatment that we define as being efficacious. Patient undergoes standard uh, therapy, a STOOP protocol. We follow our patients on a three-month basis in a multidisciplinary clinic with our neuro-oncologist, myself, and uh, the radiation oncologist with uh, MRI or PRN if they worsen. When, once we reach a GBM recurrence, we would then institute the, com, uh, the combination therapy, uh, novel treatment for them. Um, we're also uh, working with this company, Certis Oncology, of doing a similar partnership for melanoma patients in addition to the GBM patients, as we have uh, uh, Sutter's Avatar program has been uh, uh, very um, active in the, the um, uh, melanoma uh, field. So uh, with respect to the murine tumor research, it's uh, um, Nico has developed a myriad tool that's a 25 gauge catheter that now allows us to actually uh, sample the tumors that we are growing in our PDX models. Um, the, just as the tool for humans, it allows for 360 de uh, degree rotation of the cutting cannula so we can take out a nice core in the middle of these tumors. And we have been successful in biopsying a new mouse and having the mouse recover. And we're hoping that this will allow us potential to serially biopsy these, mouse, uh, these mice uh, and, and basically study the effect of uh, various therapies in, in each mouse and look at their uh, response, uh, the actual genetic or genomic and mRNA responses within the tumor. Um, and we, through CERTIS, we also now have access to a couple mouse MRIs uh, so that we can, uh, you know, this actually shows the biopsy site within a tumor. Uh, uh, so that we can base, uh, do these serial investigations within each single mouse, which will, the mice aren't cheap, so it saves some money to be able to keep them alive and, and do some serial biopsy. Uh, and that's all I had to present. I'm uh, thankful, and, and I do have uh, Dr. Sorciano, who's actually the brains of our operation. I'm, I just get the tissue. I don't do much else. Uh, and uh, but was afforded the opportunity to present today, and I greatly appreciate uh, being allowed to uh, be involved in this uh, program. Happy to answer any questions you have. Great, thank you, Dr. Dickinson. That was um, fabulous. We did have a few questions come in. Um, one is after you have the sample, what is the process for transporting? <laughs> so we use a. Uh, a 
you know, the, the specimen is cooled and put on ice. So it's uh, sitting at four degrees centigrade. And it, uh, we basically get it across the bay by courier. So that's all set up ahead of time. My research nurse basically is in the room. Uh, we collect the tissue. She takes it out of the chamber that you saw, the myriad chamber. And then the, the uh, gross specimen is basically put in ice as well. And it's uh, couriered across the bay. And the reason there's that window of two to six hours, if you've ever been to the Bay Area, you know, traffic can be a, sig a significant uh, problem. And uh, Lily and her, uh, Dr. Sorciano and her techs await the specimen and it's immediately uh, cultured at that point. Great. Um, and then we had another one come in. Do you collect all tumors with this? Uh, new methodology or just GBM? Uh, no, we've been collecting, uh, you know, for those patients who consent, we've been collecting uh, all meta uh, metastases that are of interest to Dr. Sorciano's lab. Uh, we don't have the funding to do all METs at this point. Uh, as, we, uh, as we try to expand and uh, obtain more funding, we would then expand those uh, tumors that we would be studying. Right now, it's melanoma, breast carcinoma, and lung carcinomas that we collect. All right, thank you. Um, have you spoken to pharma companies about the ability to um, serial biopsy while keeping the mouse alive? This could be innovative for novel therapeutic development. Interested in your comments, and if I can have a few of them reach out to you. Oh, we would love that. Uh, both Dr. Sorciano and I have uh, been uh, trying to develop more partnerships with uh, Farm. Uh, our, our association with Certus Oncology has been quite helpful in uh, working on some of those relationships, but please, any, uh, any assistance would be greatly appreciated because uh, as you know, if we're going to do this as a, a clinical trial, it becomes, uh, you know, money can't be an influence uh, in being able to participate. So all of the drug has to be supplied within the trial. And uh, that's where we're running into a hitch funding wise right now. Great. And um, just to add to that, if anyone would like to get in touch with any of the presenters, um, you can email the SSG at info at subcorticalsurgery.com, and I'll add that to the chat. Um, we did have Dr. Dickinson, one. Sorry. Um, we have another question that's come in to us. Um, and actually, Dr. Rodriguez, this would be directed to you as well, if you could both um, share. What would you each say is kind of the biggest barrier or challenge um, for other institutions to implement these types of techniques for collecting tissue for precision medicine and research? So I'll go ahead and get started. I, I think um, it's just integration with uh, the neurosurgeon. I, I think obviously, um, myself and Dr. Dickinson are neurosurgeons. So you, you really, I don't think your program will be successful if you don't have a neurosurgeon that is interested in this work um, because there is so much that happens in the OR um, that's critical. And, and I, something I didn't stress enough is the interplay with the communication with pathology. We never take tissue and compromise the patient getting a diagnosis. Um, so you have to be very, you need a, you need a neurosurgeon that, you know, understands that and also kind of knows what to send you is if you just get a piece of tumor that may not be relevant for your research question. You don't know where it's from. You don't know if it's just a bunch of necrosis. You really have to talk to each other. So I think that's key. Um, and then also time from the OR to the lab. Um, and then um, I think those are those are all key things. And then it is helpful if you have funding um, as well, because all these things are, are expensive. Um, and then the last thing about precision medicine, I think it's timing. Um, I didn't talk about benign tumors, but for malignant tumors, you don't have a lot of time. So 
you saw the patient I showed you, I operate on him over 10 times. That sounds crazy, but he's perfectly fine. No, no deficits. Um, we're, we're surgically aggressive here. That, so that's a little different than other institutions that don't even touch recurrent GBM patients. Um, but if a surgery can be done safely, I think um, you can help the patient a lot. Um, but the time is an issue because their tumor is going to grow back very rapidly. Um, and so that's why I'm more of a fan of organoids um, because we can get information quickly um, because sometimes you don't have weeks or months. The tumor is already growing back. Yeah, that was an amazing case, by the way, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, 10 surgeries in a successful patient. We also on um, recurrence operate and I send Lily tissue. We didn't show some of the interesting results we found on having multiple specimens from the same patient, just like Dr. Rodriguez shows that we're, you learn so much by seeing what, how the tumors responded to STUP protocol and then what the new mutations or the new RNA data is telling you about possible therapies. Um, as far as collection, it's, it, you know, not to be a chill for her and Nico, but the Myriad tool does make it very simple. Your, your specimen's already chilled and, in, and being collected at four degrees centigrade. And so it's quite straightforward then to get that shipped to whoever is going to be doing your uh, um, you know, live tissue assessment. But that still requires a body in the OR that, you know, who's going to employ the person that has to get that tissue out and, and uh, processed. So yeah, there's uh, it, the minimum cost is the, F, the FTE for that um, and, and coming up with a good collection uh, vehicle. Uh, other than that, I think, um, uh, you know, we can't expect most community hospitals. I, I'm blessed to have Dr. Sorciano and a, a, a funded research lab nearby, um, but most community hospitals, you're not going to have the technology to do the mouse work or to, to uh, set up your own uh, genomic testing. So it's something that's going to be a send out and uh, assistance from your pathologist and, and knowing which tissue to uh, take, as Dr. Rodriguez pointed out, I think those are the key key features in being successful with this kind of program. Thank you. And there is a follow-up question to both of your responses there about getting the neurosurgeon on board. Um, so what are some of the ways that you found success in getting a team that supports this? Well, for me, you know, one, it's the passion of taking care of these patients and seeing them survive. And in clear, you're not going to see that unless you're doing these more novel, this more novel work now. That it, 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 I think having because we have a multidisciplinary clinic, and I see those these patients until their death in in follow up, uh, you just feel very engaged in being part of the process. And and so if you create a clinic like that, and uh, you know, I think at any institution, I'm sure Dr. Rodriguez does the vast majority of this work at her center and wants to be that doctor. I'm the same way within my group and within the Sutter region. Uh, they know I'm the go to guy so that, uh, you know, I can have a practice that's uh, really focused on, on this disease and, and its treatment and metastatic disease as well. Uh, so I think uh, it, it, you have to start with a, a passionate surgeon who wants to be involved with cancer therapy. Yeah, I will uh, concur with Dr. Dickinson uh, for sure. I, I happen to be a, a clinician scientist, so I have an independent laboratory. So, um, but I, I do have a very supportive uh, chair who that was part of our vision. Um, you know, in, in Arkansas, we, we practice in a rural state. We're the only academic center in the state. Um, and so people um, have limited options. They don't really have necessarily the financial means to, to fly around and go to the hottest new trial. Um, and so we wanted to think about, well, what can we do for our patients? Um, and I think it's a, it's not just the, the tumor biobanking, it's the next generation sequencing and the tumor biobanking. We also did, um, and I, talked about it a little bit, the biobank paper that we wrote, um, our rates of 
having people engage in the program increased significantly when we hired someone specific to our department of neurosurgery that that is their job like they literally make sure to coordinate all of our sequencing go to the or between the, the or and the lab and so we hired someone to do that and that had helped a lot but um, again it is a lot of big infrastructure building and then a lot of learning i i didn't show you guys um the rates that the Dr. Dickinson and Dr. Sorosino, Sor, sorry, I'm not sure how to say your name, um, but that they show in their group are really, really good. Um, I see a lot of papers published and they're like 80% viability and we're growing tumors from over 90%. I don't believe those papers, at least when you first start out that first year, trust me, you're going to be like, oh my God, this is really hard. Some tumors are hard to grow, some are easier. It's so heterogeneous. Um, and you learn, you get better over time. So you have to really invest. It's not like you start the program and two months later, you're doing precision medicine. You have to wait like a year later. And from this case I showed, one of the things is comparing your patient to others. You have to like get enough patients that you have a cohort to start comparing people to each other. So um, it really takes a lot of in investment and time. Lily, can you comment on how, uh, how you're able to run, do your magic and have such a high uh, concordance and high uh, success rate? You gonna oh. <laughs> are you going to share those secrets? Thank you. It's all about the neurosurgeon. I was going to say, you, uh, our best neurosurgeons are our champions. Without them, we couldn't even start doing this. But it does have to do with tissue collection and a very integrated team. And I concur with Dr. Rodriguez's assessment. I, this, I've done this work for more years than I care to, <laughs> to say here. But in terms of the avatar program, we've been around for six years now. So we had people train and learn how to do all the steps of, of the process from, you know, intracranial injections to culturing cells in three-dimensional um, spheres, um, high throughput drugs, and all these steps have to be very well coordinated. So it's, it, it's not an overnight success story by any means. But I think consistency, having good protocols, keeping on top of, you know, what's new and the, our collaboration, uh, academic collaboration with Nico is remarkable in that way, in which we, we learned how, you know, using this tissue from harvested with a myriad makes a big difference um, in, in processing time and, and other um, and subsequent analysis of the tissue. So um, I, I think it's very doable and there are many institutions who do it. We have big, you know, um, competition here from other institutions like UCSF and so forth. I think the beauty of this, of our system is that we're the only lab doing that. So Dr. Dickinson has one, one address for his, for the career, as opposed to many, many investigators fighting over tissue, which is um, the case in, in very large academic centers. So we have a lot of patients um, that come for primary care and then um, a very dedicated research team and, you know, I, I think that we owe to our patients to, to get something back and to change that first slide or sentence that comes, I think for all of us who present GBM work that didn't change in as many years as I learned, the, the median survival is still around 14 months and this is just unacceptable. So we need to do better. I think this is what drives all of us. And I see another question here in the Q&A. Um, do either of your institutions perform liquid biopsy? Yes, yes. we do. Um, so I guess there's a difference between FDA approved and not FDA approved. So FDA approved liquid biopsy is currently for you know lung cancer um, that comes to mind. Liquid biopsy for brain tumors is not yet FDA approved. So um, However, there's a lot of great work um, by various labs um, showing that uh, plasma as well as cerebral spinal fluid um, has cell-free DNA that can be indicative um, of the tumor diagnosis. 
Um, so for research purposes, we have explored liquid biopsy and we're trying to expand that work, um, but it's not something that's used clinically um, at this time. That, that's the same for us too. We, um, we collect liquid bi uh, blood specimens on every patient along with the, the tumor specimen. And uh, Lily may want to comment on what, what she does with that because I don't do anything with it. Yeah, we, we are the less circulating tumor DNA um, and our results to date, and this is all research, um, I, it's, it's not CLIA certified, um, but our results to date indicate that for other tumor types, like Dr. Rodriguez said, we have a much better ability to, um, to identify driver mutations and follow them along as the patient undergoes treatment. So that's a very useful tool. For brain tumors, we were able to look at a brain metastasis much more successfully than at primary brain tumors in terms of plasma. I think CSF is a fantastic source, but it's not easy to get. And I think the clinicians would agree it's not always indicated, so it, it's not as peripheral blood, but, but that's where I saw most published work for primary brain tumors, of different kinds as being um, associated with circulating tumor DNA mutations that are relevant to the, to the tumor. Okay, great. great. Um, so we're, we're a little over on time here. Let's, we've got um, just two more quick questions and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. We had a question come in. Can you share the journals this information was published in? Great talks, thanks. Um, so I will say that our biobank um, paper is in um, Frontiers in Oncology, which I believe Dr. Dickinson mentioned his work was also in. And then our second paper in regards to that unique patient is in Cells, C-E-L-L-S. Okay, great. And then the final question is, did pathology have any problems with the tissue change or how you are delivering it to them in a chopped up fashion? Our team wants the tissue in large on block sections. Um, so I would say we never changed how we deliver tissue to pathology. We still give them chunks of tumor in a traditional format. Um, and then we confirm that they have enough for diagnosis. And then the rest of the leftover tissue, we you know maybe chop up with the myriad or, or various ways and, and give to the lab. Um, but the protocol with pathology never changed. I will say if you implement this in your institution, um, some places don't let you take tissue directly from the OR to the lab. They want you to go through pathology first. And you just have to be very conscientious to let them know, don't open the tubes, don't contaminate anything. We're gonna be trying to do sterile techniques with this. Um, so you have to really work with your own institution. Personally here, we don't do that. We bypass pathology for the research specimens, but uh, with a caveat that we make sure that pathology has what they need before we start sending tissue from the OR. Because again, we never want to compromise our patient and they need to get a diagnosis. Uh, yeah, we're the same. We, uh, we bypass pathology for all the research tissue. The, I have a research coordinator, that's my FTE, who, who does the, all the touching of the tissue. And it's a separate process. And as you saw, I always take a gross specimen with forceps to be sent for path. Um, we have done some, uh, you know, micro, like a, the, the, the size of these tissues isn't that different than taking a core biopsy. So if you were doing a, you know, a, a deep seated GBM and you just were doing a biopsy with a standard 1.2 millimeter by 10 millimeter uh, uh, biopsy core, uh, each bite would be about half that. It'd actually be a little wider because the, the tool has a two, I think it's 2.2 millimeter width. And depending on how, you, how you're how you sucking it into the port, you can actually get a piece of tissue that's about as big as the usual core needle you're doing anyway. Um, there's some tricks to do that, but yeah. All right. Well, um, I'm going to give one quick plug to our annual meeting, which we're actually going to host again in person back in Boulder. 
It's going to be held July 22nd to the 23rd. So I hope everyone can mark their calendars and attend. Um, registration will probably open up early um, in the new year. So please look for more information. We hope to have um, tissue will definitely be a hot topic at the meeting. So um, I want to thank everyone for coming. And Dr. Dickinson or Dr. Rodriguez, do you guys have any closing comments for the group? Only go to the meeting. It's always a, it's a not a huge affair and lots of great discussion with that's where I learned all of this was uh, at that meeting and I'm sure Dr. Day will be there so since he couldn't moderate today we'll, we'll get to see him there and he always has the best talk because he's completely honest about how he does things. Uh, there's not as much ego at this meeting as, as your typical neurosurgery. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and I guess I, I would uh, like to follow up and just say that, um, you know, again, I'm biased, I am a neurosurgeon, um, but, you know, the capabilities of um, what you can do um, in regards to sampling tissue safely um, really depends on, on the surgical skill. Um, and like Dr. Dickinson was talking about, how you take out a tumor is kind of different when you're thinking of research in mind, um, but then also making sure that it's safe and that you do have good hemostasis at the end. And, and so there are some nuances that are not typical. And, and that's something we even talk to about our residents. Like, hey, I'm taking out this tumor in a very specific way because I'm thinking of research. It's not the same way that I would if I wasn't thinking about that. All right. Well, thanks again, and we hope to see everyone soon. Have a great evening.